Hey everyone! I'm excited to share that my first book, Broken to Better, 13 Ways Not to Fail at Life and Leadership, will launch on Amazon and other online retailers shortly after. The process of writing this book has been enlightening and energizing. I've enjoyed reflecting on my time as CEO of Branded Group and sharing my entrepreneurial journey as well as the lessons I've learned in my goal to be better. The book is organized around 13 Be Better principles. Here is a peek into a few of them. One, be connected. Business is always about relationships. Two, be fearless. Never be afraid to step out of your comfort zone. Three, be purposeful. Create value for your clients and your employees with your products and services. Four, be service oriented. Solve your clients' problems better than anyone else. Five, be generous. Give back in whatever way you can to improve your community and the world. I'm confident that the book will help you to be better for your team, your clients, and your community. After you've read it, please consider leaving a review on Amazon and also consider sharing it or gifting it to your family and friends. If you'd like to talk with me about the book, you can reach me at mkerland at branded-group.com. Thank you. Hello, I'm Michael Kerland, CEO and co-founder of Branded Group, an award-winning facility maintenance and construction management company that services multi-site commercial properties, such as retail, restaurants, healthcare facilities, and educational institutions. Welcome to the Be Better podcast. Each week, I interview thought leaders from a variety of industries who will share their stories and the lessons they learn as they strive to be better for their clients, partners, employees, and their community. Are you ready to be better? Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Be Better podcast. I'm your host, Michael Curland. Joining me today is Michael Walsh, co-founder and CEO of Careloop. Michael, welcome to the show. Please tell the audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Yeah, thanks, Michael, for having me. Um, real pleasure. Love the show. So, yeah, I mean, I'm the co-founder CEO of a company, as you mentioned, called Caraloop. Um, we provide what we call the world's first tech-enabled, human-powered caregiver support platform. Uh, probably a bit of a unique topic for your show and, and the audience. Uh, but it's a platform designed to help family caregivers and parents as they're going through, as you and I were just talking pre-show, like the inevitable journey of you know, taking care of a, a parent or a grandparent or a son or daughter or a spouse or maybe a friend or neighbor or domestic partner. Uh, just especially the last couple of years, like a lot of us have experienced this. It's just a really tough journey to have to go on. And it can feel rather lonely and a bit chaotic and debilitating at times. We built the platform to pair families up with a dedicated care coach, a, a professional uh, that's coming from a, a health or medical background, who's going to go on this journey with you and your family and, and help you through all these really complicated decisions that you have to make. Uh, so just to give a bit of background on, on this story, Michael, like 15 years ago, I went through a really tough caregiving situation in my family with um, my grandfather on my mom's side. Uh, so a little bit about me. I'm the oldest of five kids. Uh, it's me. I've got four younger sisters. My three youngest sisters are actually 9, 10, 11 years younger than I am. And so in 2007, 2008, I was just graduating from Purdue University and starting my career in the consulting space. And uh, this happened with my grandfather and it just sent ripple effects through the family. Like my mom had to be with my grandfather on and off for about two years and he was in Michigan. We have a family business back in the suburbs of Chicago, still to this day that runs. And uh, when this happened, my mom, who is just, was a stay-at-home mom, like she had to go. Like that meant that Michael, I had to be working, and I had to be for a period of time, like mom and dad to, to my sisters. And so this was my introduction to what happens with families, and just again how chaotic it can be. Uh, so yeah, about ten years ago now, uh, one of my best friends in the world, Steve Diesfeld, and I—I I mean, he had gone through a similar situation as well with his family. And man, did it just feel really lonely to to do this? And it was literally the cocktail napkin where we said, "We got to build something that can help make this better." So we've been at it now for just over a decade. Careloop was actually founded in July of 2012, uh, so we'll celebrate our tenth birthday here next month. Uh, but absolutely love what we get to do and how many people we get to help and. Um, it's great to get up every day and, and do the work we do. So again, pleasure to be here and excited to dig in. 
Yeah, totally. And I think, uh, you know, pre-show we talked about a few different things, but uh, the first thing is <clears throat> it's it's so relatable. And I think it's something that is, you know, kind of, I don't want to say it's faux pas, right? Because that's not the right word, but it's just very scary, right? And it's the thing that, it's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about, right? But this happens in every family, you know, people are either going to have something happen where they need care or they're coming to end of life where they need care. And, you know, some people it happens suddenly and, and it's it, it happens in a hospital room and you don't have to think about that. But for a lot of people, it's long, longer roads. And excuse me, I just went through this with my aunt uh, last year and she had a long battle with breast cancer uh, over 20 years on and off. Uh, went into remission four different times and she was... I think 69 years old at, at, at the end of her life and had battled so long. And my cousin and my uncle, they, they want, she wanted to be at home. She didn't want to be in a hospital anymore. She didn't want to pass, um, that way. She wanted to be a, in the comfort of her own home. And so my cousin and his daughter and, and they, they had a care plan and they, you know, let her live her last days, moments in her home. And they were, I, I stopped by for one, for one day to say my, you know, goodbyes to my aunt. And it was, like you said, it was, it was just gnarly. It was, it was, uh, it was very disruptive. She was, you know, she couldn't even speak. She was basically, you know, in an infantile state and she had to be, you know, given medicine every, every few hours to keep the pain away. And I remember walking out of there like distraught because I don't know how my cousin did that. Right. And I don't even know where he got the, the, um, knowledge to do it. But now I, I'm, I'm curious if he may have used your platform because it was, there was no nurses involved or anything. It was just him and him and his daughter doing the care. So Michael, there's, there's so many things you said that are just, it's, such an important point to bring up as it relates to this. This has actually become a bit of a tagline and a belief statement for Care Loop, just that, that we believe no one should have to go through caregiving alone because most people are, Michael, like you just are talking about, you know, your, your, your family, your cousin. My guess is, is that he, he probably took a lot of this on by himself. And there's, a, there's, there's been this stigma around this this topic you know and you and i were talking pre-show about it. it's a thing no one wants to talk about like you don't if someone in your family is not doing well for a number of reasons that we can or can't explain this is just something that we, we don't go around broadcasting like we we sort of put our head in the sand and just kind of focus and we feel like first of all it's not people's business like that's kind of the first thought and number two it's like you know i'm gonna do everything i possibly can to be there for in this case like your aunt so it, we see it a lot, Michael. It's just a really hard thing to be able to watch and, or to have to watch. Like, um, so this is why we got into this space. Like it was personal experience, but also just watching what so many people were struggling through with their family members, just the ability to give them someone that's in their corner who can be working behind the scenes so that in this particular example, Michael, you and your cousin, you get to be there for your aunt and not have to decipher the really complicated health and medical system that we all have to, to navigate. Um, like, so even the hospice providers that were set up and some of the things that at home, like those were things that Caraloop can help with so that you don't have to figure all that out. You know, we can coordinate a lot of that for you. Yeah. So I appreciate you sharing. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, you know, I, thank you. And I, I, it's not easy, but it's, I think it's important to share the story, especially with what we're talking about right now. So. I guess what just came to mind for me is is awareness. What what is Carol Loop doing to bring awareness to the stigma of this of this conversation and making it a, a, a normal thing and normalizing it? Yeah, this was a key question for us years and years ago, and it kind of drills down into the go to market strategy and the brand we wanted to create over the long haul. In the early days of Carol Loop our focus was a bit more on direct to consumer, like actually trying to reach these caregivers and create an experience for them individually. And what we found was, was that many of these folks that were using the early versions of Caraloop, we were seeing trends in our data and usage stats around when they were using it. 
And so most of the folks in the early days using it, and still this trend, hold, it holds to this day. Like I've actually just recently seen some of our uh, data and analytics on the platform and still the trend line holds. Most folks are using our platform, Michael, Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. They're at work. And so this was a big aha to us years ago about the opportunity to partner with uh, corporations, small businesses, you know, insurance companies, uh, retirement administrators, like folks that work in the corporate community to create programs whereby employees, all of us as, as you know, the workforce have access to support mechanisms. And so we went to market about six, seven years ago and pivoting away from, from retail and B2C, starting to partner with companies to provide CareLoop uh, as an employee benefit so that we could send a message alongside your employer to help to destigmatize this issue, that your employer is behind this and supporting this. It is okay to ask for help. It is okay if you need to take a leave of absence to take care of a loved one, or you need to take a leave of absence for yourself and someone is taking care of you. Like it really became, how do we partner with businesses and the community at large to send this message that we get it and we know this isn't a fad. This is something everybody's going to go through and we're going to support you through it. So we work with you know, some incredible organizations from Fortune 50 brands all the way down to small businesses with 20 people uh, to roll CareLoop's platform out and lots of different messaging and communication around caregiving and parenting to destigmatize it, to make it feel safe and really drive a lot of these families to get help. Yeah. Uh... That's great information, and I'm really happy you brought that up. It's it, it brings a lot of questions to mind. We, I was on a, a podcast earlier today, and we were talking about kind of like how business has shifted, and and uh, you know conscious capitalism and things of that nature. And you know, I don't know. You, it seems like you're in your mid to late 30s, uh, based on when you graduated. Uh, I'm in my early 40s, and you know, so I, I think you are like an early millennial. Is that correct? If if uh, we're going I'm, by generation, I'm technically a geriatric millennial. <laughs> if you have followed this term, <laughs> I did not. I did not. You just taught me something new, but that's great. So I am, <laughs> I am a gen. Uh, I am like late Gen X, right? You're just on the cusp of, of millennial. Or so what we were talking about was, and I'll get to my point. Is you know when I started working. Uh, 20 years ago uh, when I graduated, it, there was no empathy in the workplace. There was no, uh, you know, oh, your your mom's sick and you have to take care of her at home. Well, do that shit at 501 when you get out of here because it's nine to five, you're mine, you know, and I don't, and I want you to compartmentalize. I want you to just focus on your job. And I, the shift has happened uh, since I've owned Brandon Group, which is uh, almost nine years now. And uh, that's when I started focusing on it for us, uh, leading with empathy, right? And so, you know, you just said you're about to celebrate your 10 year and you said earlier, you know, off show, take care of your people so that the, your people can take care of your business. I thought that was a very uh, good quote to use in, in this. And so my question very long windedly is when did you start seeing that shift or has it always been uh, for the past decade kind of the same? Have you seen a shift in the last 10 years or has it always been kind of the same? Without a doubt, but there were some things that I think we really focused on in the early days of CareLoop that I wanted to make sure that we were part of that solution, Michael, that we were part of inspiring companies to uh, embrace that empathy and to take more of that position and embrace that philosophy of caring for, for their folks and creating a culture of care within their organization. Um, we, we internally care loop, we're not always this way. Like, you know, this is, um, my first startup, you know, I came from that first job was corporate America. It was just as you described, uh, not a whole lot of empathy. You know, you're expected to be a hundred percent chargeable. I was a consultant, it, you know, like there's no, t if you need time off, you have PTO for that. Otherwise, like, you know, we need you to be billing your, you know, billing your rates out and working with clients and traveling everywhere, like do your job. Um, so uh, coming from that environment in the early days, that was what I knew. And I think we, we pretty early on there, we saw that, Hey, if we're really going to be successful and building and selling a product and creating a brand around this, then we have to double down on operating this way internally. And we have to be the best possible stewards and examples for this movement and how we take care of our own people and the programs that we create, because like, this is what we're selling. 
Like, and if we're not doing it, then you know, why would anybody want to buy this from us? So there's definitely been a shift. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, over the next 10 years, we see even more work done and more progress in this area where more companies are recognizing that uh, if they're going to be the best in class employers of the future, they have to embrace this. They, they can't ignore this. The time really is now to, to start to make this shift and build these, these tenants into your business. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's one of the main things that millennials are focused on as they become the majority of the workforce is that they want to have something to believe in. It's not about just the paycheck, right? You, you can, you know, for 5,000 more somewhere else, but to have a, a shittier work environment, your, your generation is not going to take that extra 5k. You want to work where you have the culture, you have the purpose. And, uh, I think, I think that over the next 10 years, if your business isn't doing this, then you're going to be archaic and you're going to find yourself the way of the dodo. So I completely agree with you. And like some of the, the names that probably our parents really idolized when we were kids, like some of the, the corporate names that you think about, like, you know, the, the IBMs of the world, for example, like just th these models. Um, they just don't work anymore for today's society, for millennials and Gen Z. You're right. They want, they want a purpose. Like they want to feel like they're part of something. Even if you're a more traditional type of employer, like it's okay for a manufacturing company to then build in a mechanism whereby they support a certain cause or a certain issue that's really important to their brand and, and their, their people. Like that, that's the type of thing that you want to talk about in an interview with a prospective teammate is, what you stand for, like the job's the job, right? But like, what do we believe in and why are we here? Like that's, that's going to be become such a huge part, I believe of the work experience of the future. Absolutely. Um, so a good segue. We talked a little bit as well that, you know, you are also a PBC and you're about to become a B Corp. So tell the audience a little bit about, uh, what it takes to be both what actually what a, PBC and what a B Corp is and what it takes to become a little bit of both. Cause I think those are important things that a lot of people don't know about and let's bring some awareness to that right now. Yeah. I, I appreciate you bringing this up. I mean, we, we have been looking at the opportunity to convert Caroloop from a Delaware C corporation, which is what we were founded as, uh, to a Delaware public benefit corporation or PBC. We had been looking at this for several years. We finally made the conversion. Uh, in early 2021, so about 18 months ago. What a public benefit corporation is, it is a for-profit uh, you know, entity. Like we, we're not a non-for-profit, we're a for-profit entity, but what it allows, encourages, enables us to do is to build more of a stakeholder capitalistic model into our governance structure, whereby our management team, our board, even our shareholders, like that we wanna be mindful of all of our stakeholders not just not just our investors you know the traditional corporation you know the, the role of a corporation is to create returns for its shareholders that that is the that's the old definition the new definition is to create value for all stakeholders so who are your stakeholders they are your your shareholders your investors they are your team your customers your vendor partners they're your community your environment like there's there's all of these different groups that you have to be mindful of so as a public benefit corporation, what you often see, and just to name a few that are a little bit more commonplace, uh, Patagonia, uh, Tom Shoes, Bomba Socks, uh, Code Epoxy, you know, in the, the retail and, and, and uh, clothing space, like these are companies that have lemonade in the ins insure tech space. Like these are companies that have actually built give back mechanisms into their business model, whereby the more successful they are on the business side of it, the more they can give back to charities, nonprofits, like, and donate to issues that are really important to them as a company, as a brand. These are some of your best to work types of, 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 you know, award winners every year. Like these are the companies, Michael, to your last point, like that people want to go work for. Um, so Caroloop made this conversion about a year and a half ago. Um, it's been a real great transition. We're actually just to put out, just about to put out our first impact report, summarizing all the incredible things that as a result of our business and growth, uh, the nonprofits we've been able to help, the volunteer time that we give to our team to go out into their communities and support, uh, the amount of free service we've given away to families who need help, like just all of these things. 
and you mentioned we're going through the B Lab uh, certified B Corp process now. We've actually been going through it for just about the same amount of time since when we converted to a PVC about a year and a half. Um, and that will just further differentiate and elevate Caraloop's mission and brand uh, to the global stage and in this really incredible consortium of companies that are uh, building in stakeholder capitalism into their business models and into their strategy. So it's a really incredible thing to be able to, to look at and do and certainly encourage employers of all sizes to, even if you can't make these conversions or embrace these certification opportunities, to embrace the principles and to take a good, strong look at like what they stand for and why. Um, I, I mentioned you pre-show, like these things don't define Caraloop. They were actually a really natural thing for us because this is what we were doing and how we were doing it anyway. So yeah, yeah thanks for bringing this. Yeah, totally. It's, point. it's something that we at Branded Group align with you a hundred percent. The only thing that we haven't done is I didn't even know PBC was a, was a thing until we spoke, uh, and we looked at the B Corp and we just haven't started going down that route. We're, we're still on the fence of if we want to, because as you mentioned, you started, you know, 18 months ago and you're still not done. It was a very daunting task and uh, not that it's not worth it, but I have a child on the way right now. And <laughs> we had, we had a bunch of other things that we were dealing with. We just didn't know if it was the right time to make that, that, that de de decision, but we do the same. We, you know, where we, it doesn't define us even if we did these two things because we d currently do, you know, the things we, we give um, volunteer hours to our team you know, we're given uh, every work order we complete. We're donating a meal with uh, Second Harvest or Food Feeding America or locally Second Harvest Food Pantry out here in Orange County. Uh, and we deal with a, a lot of other nonprofits with Habitat for Humanity, Orange Coats Keepers and the such. So uh, I totally am aligned with everything you're saying. It's great. It's great. I love what you're doing. But I want to ask you, let's. Let's boast a little. What's on that impact report? What, like, what are the highlights? The audience wants to know. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I've, only, I've seen the drafts of it. Like, so I can't wait myself to see the final report. But um, like, you know, a couple of stats we can certainly share is like last year uh, in 2021, um, we donated to, I want to say like just over 100 nonprofits, like as a result of our business. So it's a really incredible logo slide to see all of the different organizations that because of our growth, we were able to support. And we had our entire team kind of conspiring with us on this, helping guide us to the causes that are really important to them. So that was a really incredible thing. Um, the amount of volunteer hours that we're giving to our team, it's about 1% of all of our time. So if you assume that each of us has 2,080 hours of work time in a year, it's about 21 hours that we give in just time for folks to go volunteer in their community. So anxious to see the final stat on where we're at there. But uh, I know me personally, I, I volunteer at Children's Health here in Dallas uh, twice a month for four hour shifts. Uh, so I mean, what about 10 hours a month, 120 hours a year, I'm, I'm down at Children's just donating time. Um, so trying to set an example for the team that this is just a really important thing to give back to your community and be a part of you know, the solution. Uh, so, I mean, there's a number of other factors that we're, we're gauging as well, like even just the impact that we're having on our members and how much time we're saving them. So back to your story that we talked about pre-show with, you know, just your family and all the things that have gone on. If, if we could have been a part of that journey and just save you, you know, you and your family some time along the way, like that's impactful. So Absolutely. these are the things that we're hoping to capture. As well. well, I really appreciate that you uh, yourself, you know, do 120 hours a year. Uh, leading by example, it's it's such a underrated uh, thing for leadership these days. I, I really think it's always been something on the forefront for me as the CEO is, you know, don't talk about it, be about it, right? Get out there, roll up your sleeves. And when we go to, we do a lot of food uh, drive stuff where we're at, you know, the second harvest out here in Orange County and just repackaging their shallots, for example, into smaller bags and making sure that the the bad ones get tossed away. So I'm out there with my team, sleeves rolled up, you know, getting dirty and smelling like onions. So um, I, I think there's something to be said about that. It it, it, it makes you authentic, it makes you authentic. It's not just uh, words on a wall. So I appreciate that from you. So I wanted to ask you, where where do you see Caraloop in this industry going in the next five years? What's, what's next 
like what's on the horizon because you've conquered you've conquered a lot of big things you've done a lot of great things thus far 10 year anniversary that's nothing to scoff at so what's next for you guys oh we've got a really ambitious and bold vision for where we see all of this going over the next five ten years um, and it's I'll, I'll say michael mostly supported by just the demographic trends in our country and in our world like there's just a lot more people every single month every single year that need help with their families like our country's not getting any younger or healthier it's going the other way and uh, the way that we're headed here you know in about 20 or so years there's going to be not enough of us to take care of those that need the help so uh, again for us it's how do we start to build into our infrastructure as a country and society ways that we can be helping families navigate these really tough times. Like you got to start now. It's going to take a while. Um, you know, I mentioned we've mostly focused on employee benefits and working with employers. We need to expand like that footprint and we need to take the story beyond just the, you know, the corporate ecosystem. We've got to work with insurance companies. We've got to work with hospitals. We've got to work with physicians. We've got to work with, you know, local communities. We've got to work with our politicians and governments. Like we need to make this uh, a lot more of a stakeholder driven effort and initiative to really change this. So uh, while I'm incredibly grateful for all the success and the impact we've had on families in the, the last 10 years since we've been around, we still got a lot of work to do. Um, and that's just here in the United States we're talking about. There's certainly parts of our world, Michael, that they're hurting a lot more than we are just in terms of their family caregiving situations. Um, how do we reach them? How do we get to them? Uh, how do we partner with organizations to bring care loop to those families? Uh, so these are the things I'm thinking about. Just how do we, we take what we've built and really bring it to the, to the masses? Uh, a lot of work to do, but it'd be really, uh, really fun to do it. Yeah, it seems like this should be a universalized uh, platform for everyone. I mean, I, I can't think of anyone that won't at some point in their life use this platform. So uh, I hope that your vision comes to a reality, uh, you know, and, and to your point it, it, here in the country, I was just watching the news, which I never do, but I caught a snippet of it on the walk out before we started recording it, and, you know, 62% of uh, Americans are, have moderate to, you know, moderate heart health right now, which is not good. 62% of Americans. I mean, I think me and you are in, probably in that 38%, but you know, there's that, that's more than half of our country that has moderate health, heart health issues. So. Uh, Michael, you could, I mean, take that, go down the, the mental health, you know, uh, column and then just, how many folks are dealing with chronic anxiety, have bipolar issues, have just, uh, you know, so much stress and emotional turmoil that they're dealing with, you know, so you bring up a physical issue, but you have to then multiply that to the, the, the nth degree as it relates to also the, the mental health crisis we have in this country. Um, there's just a lot of people that need help and a lot of caregivers that don't get the attention of the healthcare system because they're really not recognized. You know, the, the system recognizes the patient, the provider, and the payer. But you and I as caregivers, like we're not really part of the solution. We're sort of outsiders to the system. So we gotta change this. Like, how do you bring everybody in? How do you make this um, a lot more integrated? Um, there's a lot of work to do there. So yeah, yeah, it's a staggering statistic you share. Um, there's a lot of scary stats as it relates to this, not just around physical health, but mental health as well. Well, I think you got a lot of work to do, Michael. So thank you for doing what you've done to date. And, you know, uh, I, I can't wait to see where, where you are in five, 10 years. So, uh, it's been a great show, Michael. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, if you could please let the audience know how they can get a hold of you. Yeah, so I mean, the, the quickest and easiest way to learn more about the work that our team is doing is uh, go to carelooop.com. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a, a link, you know, posted here on the, the episode website, but C A R I L O O P.com. Um, given that we do most of our work in the, the corporate, you know, the sphere uh, and community, like, you know, there's an entire section there about how we help employers. If you've got a company you work for or a company that you know that might be really interested in the work we're doing, uh, you know, send us a, send us a, an introduction to those folks uh, on our website. We'd love to talk to them. Uh, and then for me, you know, we can make sure that my you know, Twitter and LinkedIn accounts are all linked up to the website uh, for the episode as well. 
I'm extremely responsive on those channels. We'd love to hear from you guys if there's uh, thoughts you have on this issue, maybe stories to share related to caregiving situations that you've all been through and uh, how CareLoop could or, or might have helped. Uh, always open to hearing about those uh, those ideas that you have. So uh, again, Michael, really appreciate you having part of this and uh, love the show and love the work that you're doing as well. Thanks, Michael. And audience, until next time. Thank you for tuning in. I hope that today's episode inspired you to become a purpose-driven leader in your career or your community. There is no doubt that when we lead with purpose, we can change lives. If you enjoyed today's show, I'd be grateful if you would take a moment to rate us on your preferred listening platform. To learn more about Branded Group's Be Better experience and how we provide industry-leading, on-demand facility maintenance, construction management, and special project implementation, visit us at www.branded-group.com. Be sure to follow us on social media, and you can also reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. Until next time, be better.